Masters Rowers, you are in for a real treat. This interview is just for you. I sit down with physical therapist Erin McConnell to discuss in depth her work with the rowers she sees in the greater Boston area at Spalding Outpatient Center in Brighton. You will walk away with some practical advice that you can apply to your own training. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast, a podcast focused on scientific and real-world expertise on training strategies between your ears, behind the oar handle, on the field and court, and in the strength and conditioning room. I'm your host, Joe DeLeo. I am a strength and conditioning coach, speaker, and lifelong student focused on continuous improvement. Thank you for joining me, and let's roll to today's episode. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Joe. Excited to be here. Me too. Uh, So we are going to sit down uh, this evening and we're going to kind of do a deep dive into uh, some of your your work uh, with the the Masters Rowing Athlete uh, and specifically kind of talk about uh, some of the experiences you've had in working with them and and a lot of the the injuries that come up. you know, especially with that that demographic, that that age group. Um, but before we kind of get into that, why don't you talk to us about uh, your background uh, as an athlete, as a as a clinician, um, and how you uh, became interested in working with the the rowing community? Yeah, so I grew up in Connecticut, and I started rowing there at Simsbury High School, small public high school in Connecticut. Um, And then from there went to Notre Dame and I rode at Notre Dame for four years and loved it. And when I was at Notre Dame, I studied pretty much pre-med. So I went on from there to, um, I knew I wanted to go into physical therapy school, but wasn't totally sure what to do in a little bit of time in between going to school. And I found the Institute for Rowing Leadership at CRI. And one of my um, teammates at the time and I both moved up to Boston and did this program for a year and loved it, got really into coaching. And I ended up really finding that it was a really valuable experience having then the coaching perspective, then moving on into the physical therapist role, especially then working with rowers. So um, from there, went to physical therapy school at University of Connecticut. So I was there for three years, um, did a lot of research when I was there with um, soccer players and did some injury prevention program um, type stuff with them, which got me really into, again, injury prevention kind of stuff then with rowers going forward. So once I graduated from PT school, I really kind of dove right into working with rowers, which was the population that I knew I wanted to work with from the start and um, have pretty much been there and working with that population since. I, about a year ago, joined the team at Spalding in Brighton and a couple other great therapists there also work with rowers. So we've had a great team atmosphere where we've been able to um, really bounce ideas off each other. And uh, we developed an Instagram account, Upstream Physios, and we've had fun kind of building that from the bottom up. So yeah, it's been a fun ride and going from athlete to coach for a little bit back to, you know, physical therapist for rowers has been a fun journey. Excellent. Yeah. It sounds like you've got a really well-rounded experience and um, I'm sure that that helps you out quite a bit uh, on the clinical side, being able to to relate relate to uh, all the athletes and individuals you're working with. Yeah, it definitely does. And I was an injured rower myself. I had a back injury when I was in college that got me out for the whole fall of my sophomore year. So I definitely know what it's like to be in that position. And I think my patients, my rowers really appreciate that when I say, hey, look, I don't want to tell you that you shouldn't row right now, but I've been there. I know what it feels like. And ultimately, these are the things that are best for you at this point. So coming from someone who's actually been in that position, I think is a valuable thing for them. Yeah, I have to imagine that helps to really uh, establish some some trust and buy in with them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so did the did your uh, injury, your your low back injury, did that kind of uh, also spur your interest into physical therapy? 
Definitely. I wasn't totally sure when I was in my undergrad studies if I wanted to go to med school or go to PT school. I knew I really liked working with orthopedics. So I knew that was the kind of direction that I wanted to go to, whether it was with as an MD or as a PT. And I think the um, the reason I went towards PT was because I realized how much value there is in having that person that is with you the entire time. You're seeing them multiple times a week. You're working with them for multiple hours and really working with someone who really understands. So I had, I did have a great experience at Notre Dame working with my athletic trainer, but I think I appreciated the ability to know the sport and treat athletes in that sport. I think our trainer was great, but didn't necessarily know rowing as well. So it definitely was challenging at times. So I look back on some of those experiences and say, yeah, I mean, that was great, but I think we could have done better if someone had known the sport better. So it was more learning from that saying, I think this is what the sport needs as someone who really gets it um, because not many people do. So it's been fun to work with rowers knowing the sport so well. That's, that's great. Uh, so it definitely has had a big impact, uh, you know, in your career so far. Um, and really it sounds like kind of has, uh, helped shape and, and drive, uh, kind of where you want to spend some some of your time at, both in terms of who you're working with, the, the populations that you're working with, um, athletes overall, definitely rowers, um, but kind of also where you th- feel like you can give back and, uh, you know, where you want to try to contribute in terms of research or, or journals and also speaking engagements. You've done some of that. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so why don't we kind of dive a little bit deeper into um, – you know, the master's rowing population. Uh, and, you know, you've done some uh, presentations. Um, I believe you, you've spoken at the uh, CRI conference, correct? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so I spoke um, at just kind of a general lecture that they did there, like a coach talk on master's athletes. And then at the end of the month, I am presenting at their What Works Summit. So I'm doing the pre-conference workshop. And that's not necessarily master's athlete specific, but is actually going to be looking at more of the technical aspect and how we can look at that from an injury prevention perspective. Um, but I did present on master's athletes at CRI and also did an injury prevention class with a group of master's athletes there. And that was really helpful for them. We ran about five kind of a five class series and worked on different components of injury prevention. So that was a lot of fun. Excellent. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing some of the things that you worked on and, and yeah. individuals learned in the class. Um, so I, I think kick things off here. Why don't we just sort of establish a little bit of a, a framework of, um, you know, for the master's rower, what are some of the things uh, that they need to take into consideration in terms of training, uh, injury risk, um, that they may be more, um, susceptible to than say, a you know, junior pre elite, elite rower, co- collegiate level rower. Sure. Um, so I think some of the main differences with a master's rower are really about their history. I mean, in general, when you think about a master's athlete, they have just been around longer. So not only are they, have they been moving longer, they've been doing sports longer, they've had more time to accumulate other medical conditions that may impact their participation in the sport. Um, It's been, that I think is the key thing is that there's those experiences, that history that's there with masters that isn't necessarily there with a 15 year old or a 20 year old. So all of those things need to be taken into consideration. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, and on top of that, you know, we also, as we, we get older, uh, generally speaking, we're looking at, you know, some loss of mobility, um, absolutely in joint range of motion. Uh, then we're also dealing with things like osteoporosis, uh, sarcopenia, loss of lean muscle mass, as well as the loss of uh, power and strength. Um, mm-hmm. So, how did those those other things uh, that we just that I just mentioned kind of factor into uh, you know potential injury risks for for the masters athlete? Sure. So, I mean, 
Injury risks, definitely stuff to talk about. There's also a ton of benefits, which we don't want to overlook too. And I, I made sure to point that out when I was talking to the master's rowers at CRI saying, hey, I know we're talking about injury prevention, but what you're doing is also a really awesome thing too. So, you know, we know that there's that loss of muscle mass, potentially loss of bone density as, as people get older, but by rowing, you're combating that. You are working on maintaining that power, maintaining strength, maintaining um, some of that bone density. And rowing is people get into it often at an older age because it's low impact. I often see that it's the athlete that was a runner for a really long time and now their knees just can't handle running anymore. And so they switch to rowing. So even though rowing is now less impact, less load on the knees, they still have knees that aren't necessarily in the best shape. And it's definitely something that we need to take into account um, because of the large ranges of motion that the body needs to be able to move through with rowing. So even though it's lower impact, you still need end range knee flexion, end range hip flexion, end range ankle dorsiflexion at the catch. And that can be something that can be challenging for people to get to, especially if they have joints that might not be in as great of a shape as they were, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago. Right. That's a great point. So, um, if you're working with uh, one of those masters athletes that say say they have some limitations or restrictions in that the ankle, knee, or hip, um, how do you work with them to address that? Yeah, so I think the first thing is making sure I always do an assessment. You know, what what do each side look like? Whether it's I break out my goniometer and I'm actually measuring what that angle is side to side, or looking at it functionally. I love looking at a body weight squat and seeing what an athlete looks like doing a body weight squat. And that really tells me what is getting a little stiff, what's not. And they might just tell me, Hey, when I'm in this position, my right knee doesn't feel great. Cool. Let's take a look at it. So at that point, there's a lot we can do. We need to look at what's causing that restriction there. Is it actual joint restrictions? You know, we know that the joints as we get older develop arthritis, things like that. That's just a normal part of aging. It's just, it's not always pathological. It doesn't always hurt, but it's a normal part of aging. Those joints just aren't as smooth as they used to be. So is it the joint? Do we need to actually mobilize the joint and get the joint moving better? Or is it muscular? Is it other, you know, soft tissue related things that we can address by maybe addressing some of the muscle imbalances that have developed over their long, wonderful lifespan, you know, whether they were a runner and now they have certain balance or muscle imbalances that we need to address because of that previous sport history. So it's really about figuring out what's causing that pain or causing that limitation. And it's not the same for everyone. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that makes a ton of sense that everybody's going to have a little bit of a, a variance and they're going to have to individualize what they need to do. Um, so do you usually have them target that in their, in their warm uh, for their sessions? Yeah. So there's a few different things that athletes can work on on their own in terms of, especially in terms of joint mobility. I mean, yeah, I can get in there and manually do things, but there's definitely some things, um, especially with those really thick super bands that I really like. Those are really helpful for joint mobilization, especially at the hip and the ankle. So if an athlete has a restriction there, I tend to have that be part of their warm up. I mean, you want to go into a session either on the erg or on the water with the most amount of range of motion that you can have. So I love having them make that part of a warm up. Now, I think the important thing to address with these athletes is a lot of them don't want to do a warm up. A lot of them are getting to the boathouse at 4:55 in the morning for a five o'clock practice. And when I bring up, hey, you know, you know those bands that are hanging in the boathouse, maybe you can do a few of those before practice. And they're like, Aaron, I get to the boathouse at 4:55. I wake up at 4:20. You really want me to wake up earlier in order to get there and do this before practice? And I'm like, I wish I could get you to do this, but that can be challenging sometimes because a lot of these masters do row very early in the morning. Um, so yes, Joe, ideally I would love that to happen before practice, but sometimes practically it's a challenge. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I found that as well. I, I think, um, you know, some of that's, some of that's buy-in. Uh, some of yeah. that is also the, the 
reality that you're doing it that early in the morning. Um, and that in itself is challenging because, you know, I, I can relate to that, uh, over the past, you know, five, six years, it's just, I'm a lot stiffer in the morning than I was, you know, and that's definitely, part, yeah, it's part of getting older. So, um, you know, would you agree that, you know, in terms of warm up, um, especially for, for masters athletes, what I found so far is it, it just takes a little bit more time, um, especially early in the morning, but overall, um, it just takes me a little bit more time to get warmed up, uh, to, to kind of really get into the, the range of motion, uh, positions I want to be in, whether that's for a rowing session or a strength and conditioning session. Yeah, absolutely. And like we have both talked about, I mean, as you get older, those joints aren't as mobile as they used to be. And if you're going right from your bed to the car to the erg, and then you're banging out 90 minutes of steady state, that's not going to be the best for your body, which is already a little bit less, you know, pristine than it used to be. So (laughs) definitely, (laughs) definitely making sure that um, that warm up happens, I think is huge, no matter what time of the morning. And, you know, we also know that in the morning, and this goes for any athlete, the, the disc height of the, the lumbar discs is just higher. We, as we sleep, we get more water in our discs. And then when we wake up in the morning, so you just feel taller, which is great, but that water needs to kind of be squeezed out a little bit so that less load is actually put on the joints and put on the ligaments. And so that a lot of that happens within the first 30 minutes of waking up in the morning. So that stiffness often goes away quickly, but needs to be addressed with a good dynamic warm up that involves kind of getting that spine moving through gentle ranges of motion before you're then loading it by putting the blade in the water or hammering on um, the foot stretchers on the erg. Love it. Great, great advice there. Um, so, so coming back, uh, you provided some really good, uh, stats, uh, from one of your presentations. I just kind of wanted to, to share this and, and jump into, um, you know, another, another area of discussion here. Um, so from the, the survey done at the FISA World Masters Regatta in 2007, um, the most common uh, site of injury was low back, uh, 32.6%. Um, masters rowers sustain, compared to juniors uh, athletes, more upper extremity injuries. Um, yeah. And there was, uh, it looked at, on average about point, point 0.48 injuries per rower. Um, so it, it, from your research uh, as well as your experience, does it seem like out of the entire rowing population, so, you know, junior, collegiate, pre-elite, uh, elite, and then your, your master's population, um, where, where did the, the injuries kind of uh, fit? Is it a higher prevalence or a lower prevalence for, for that age group, that demographic? Yeah, it's actually lower. So when we look at juniors that are growing at the same level. So I don't remember exactly where this, um, where they did the, this study, but what they found is that juniors around the same level, definitely at a, you know, elite level, they had 0.99, so around one injury per rower. And that's kind of a tricky stat. I really don't like it, but essentially each rower could report more than one injury. So it's not necessarily that every single athlete that's a junior has an injury. It's more that, you know, the number of injuries reported is equal to the number of athletes, but one athlete could have zero and one athlete could have two injuries. So um, it's the same thing for these masters that 0.48 injuries per rower, but it is less. And I think that the fact that it's less is attributed to the fact that these masters athletes typically aren't rowing at as with as much volume. Um, I think that's a key factor is that the volume is typically a little bit lower than the juniors and sometimes the intensity given the power and strength loss that just inevitably happens with age. I think um, that contributes to it as well, but it is lower, which is, you know, great news for masters athletes that it's not as high as these juniors. So it's not, you know, this big, scary thing. It's, It's actually less, which is great. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Uh, the the other thing that you've mentioned too is um, as we were 
preparing for the interview, you, you noted that a lot of masters rowers actually come into the sport later in life. Um, so, so they may be entering rowing, um, at an older age. And in addition to that, they may also, um, be coming from multiple sport background. Um, and I'm yeah, sure absolutely. Yeah. So do you think that, uh, what kind of factor does that play into the fact or, or has an impact on both, um, injury, but also their, their performance in rowing and staying healthy? Yeah, I think it has a huge, um, a huge impact. So not only is it awesome, I mean, we love being part of a sport that's growing and that so many people are becoming a part of. Um, I really enjoy, you know, meeting people on the street and having them say, Oh my gosh, I, I like just started rowing. It's great. Like I did this one session with my work and we went and it was so cool. And I love that. It's so fun. Our friends who say, you know, I, I just started doing the rowing machine at the gym. Like, can you help me with form? It's cool. It's really cool that everyone's, you know, getting on board with the sport that we love so much, but that at an older age can be a little bit challenging because as we get older, it's just, happens inevitably that our rate of learning decreases. So you think about learning a new language. So I remember starting learning Spanish when I was in fourth grade and it was like, it just came to you. And it was just so easy because our brain is much more plastic and can learn things so much more quickly. When you think about learning a new language as an adult, I tried to pick up some Italian before going to Italy last summer. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on with this. I couldn't retain any of it. It was very challenging. Um, rowing and learning a motor skill is the same thing. So it's just harder for adults to learn a new motor skill when they get older. It doesn't mean they can't learn it. It just means as a novice rower, who's, you know, not a junior novice rower is more of a master's level novice, novice rower. It's a little bit harder to learn those skills, which means it just takes a little bit more time. And I think that can be a little challenging because often these athletes who find rowing at an older age have been really competitive or been really intense with another sport. So, you know, maybe they were running five times a week and they can't run anymore. And now they're into rowing and now they want to row five times a week and they want to row intensely five times a week. And they're super jazzed about it. But when you're learning a brand new motor skill and you don't know where to find your glutes and you don't know how to do the motor pattern, it gets tricky because that's when injuries can happen when you try to load the body when it's not necessarily primed to perform that movement over and over under high loads. That's very interesting. Uh, so, so what do you attribute? Um, I guess as we age, what, what's the any reasoning or, or literature behind why it's more difficult to develop or acquire motor skill at a, at an older age? Yeah. So the research, um, has, is really in a lot of different things. I mean, I think it's in both acquiring motor skills, but just in general, the brain being plastic, we learn about it a lot in the medical profession or medical professions about, um, people who are recovering from, let's say a stroke, you know, if someone has a stroke when they're 10, their brain, because it's just so still developing and it's still really working on developing all these different connections, is able to kind of rewire and, and make those connections much more easily than an older adult who's had a stroke. They can't necessarily, those, those connections are a little bit more set in stone and can't really be kind of rewired and Re, rerouted to different areas of the brain when one area isn't necessarily working as much. So a lot of learning and brain plasticity research has come from looking at conditions like that. But, you know, they look at it too, with just really simple motor tasks. There's been a study that, you know, they gave a younger and an older age group, the same exact motor task. And even though all the age groups actually improved on the first day, the older adults who perform the task didn't improve as at as much of a, a steep incline as their younger counterparts. So in general, just this rate of learning decreases because of that decrease in brain plasticity. Wow. Wow. Um, so how do we stay sharp then? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I think, I think it's about continuously doing that learning, you know, not being stagnant with it. 
it's so again, it's awesome that people are developing different motor skills at a at a later age, but it's important to be patient with it. Know that it's going to come. Know that you can learn new skills. It's just not going to happen as quickly. You can still learn Italian when you're older. It just might not happen as quickly as it was when you were in fourth grade. So I think it's the same thing where it's just about the same way they say, hey, you know, to keep your brain sharp, do crossword puzzles all the time or, you know, things like that to kind of keep your brain stimulated. It's the same thing with motor skills, you know, keep learning new motor skills, but just be patient with them and recognize that it might not come as quickly as it did when you were younger. No, that that totally makes sense. So definitely be more patient. Um, I, I'm getting the sense, too, from from your response that it, also just a variability in the activities and different types of movements you're doing overall will probably help to continue to make progress in new areas. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. Um some other risk factors that you and I have uh, discussed as we prepared for the the interview um, that really kind of um, hit home with the, the masters rowing uh, athlete population more so than than any other. Um, so a few are um, greater orthopedic issues as, as we've already discussed, um, surgery if they've had an injury, uh, and then of course. Um, you know, pregnancy and childbirth. So, um, those are kind of all, you know, big ones in and of themselves. Uh, so let's try to, you know, spend a little bit of time on, on each one, um, and, and talk about how that will kind of impact, uh, sort of overall athleticism and, and, you know, affect, you know, training and rowing in general. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so, Let's start with childbirth because I think that's a huge one. Um, you see a lot of, I mean, so many females who are master's athletes have had children, even if it was 30 plus years ago. Um, I typically find that women, no matter if it was a natural birth or a C-section, they tend to have really a hard time activating those deep core muscles. And it's, kind of obvious why, I mean, those muscles when you are pregnant are stretched quite a bit. And then if you have a C-section, they're then cut into when they're stretched. So there's a lot of trauma that happens to the transverse abdominis, kind of those deep abdominal stabilizing muscle groups. And then if it's a natural birth, the pelvic floor, which essentially works as like the the seat, the roof, sorry, or the, no, the, the floor of your core. So if you think about the core as being a cylinder, the pelvic floor kind of holds everything up from the bottom. So if that is still loose and the abdominals don't really have that ability to fire as well as they did before that pregnancy, um, it can definitely impact the ability to transfer load in the rowing stroke and lead to injury. And it's always a question I ask and people are like, oh yeah, I have three kids. They're, you know, 30, 35 and 40. And I'm like, okay, well, it still matters because the chances that you actually consciously retrained those muscle groups when you were done having children is pretty low. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. You know, I never really thought about that. And it's, it's a lot of trauma. So it's definitely something I keep in mind and I'm sure to ask um, my patients who I'm seeing who um, have an injury, especially a lower back or a hip injury, then I'm definitely asking that question. Wow. So that that's, uh, I mean, that's very helpful. And, and hopefully that, that gives, um, you know, the mothers out there some, uh, some pause to think about how that might be impacting their training and everything. But so my question for you is, um, you know, for, for those that uh, may be listening that don't have an anatomy or physiology background, you mentioned they may have a little bit more uh, difficulty like activating uh, the deep core or, or those muscles. Could you provide some examples of like difficulty or limitations in, you know, movement or, or actions? Like how would they know that they're having difficulty? You know, what does yeah. that look like? That's a really good question. Um, it can be really challenging because what happens is when our bodies, let's say, you know, following pregnancy, the those deep muscles don't fire as well, other muscles are going to take over. 
your body is going to find a way to make things happen, even if those muscles aren't firing. So it's not like you're just going to be flopping around on the floor because you don't have abdominal muscles or a pelvic floor that can fire. You're still going to function. You're still going to move. But other bigger muscle groups are going to start taking over. So it might mean that, um, for example, one of my favorite exercises to kind of look at this ability to control some of those movements is is a, just a basic dead bug. You know, everyone does that kind of exercise when they're doing core work with their team or things like that. But are they actually able to control rotation through their pelvis? Are they able to control extension through their lower back? Can they actually maintain kind of a rigid trunk while moving their arms and legs without firing up all those big muscle groups? So that's a, that's a pretty good test for that. Um, to be honest, it often comes about just because all of a sudden people are in pain and they have back pain and they then, you know, realize, oh yeah, I need to work my core. And, and often it comes when pain is already a factor. So if those muscles can be trained earlier before that pain happens, I think that's a great way to, um, to mitigate that. Sure. Uh, th- that's, um, that's very insightful. So my next question for you, um, is do you, what, what, what recommendations would you make for say, um, you know, any mother, like what are some things, strategies they could do? Um, you, you just mentioned the dead bug that they could integrate into their training that would help to, uh, you know, rebuild that core, especially if, if they've had a normal childbirth or a C-section. Yeah, good question. So um, it's it's pretty cool. A lot of um, research is coming out and a lot of especially physical therapists are coming out, especially women's health PTs are coming out with a lot on the fourth trimester. So, you know, normal pregnancy, three trimesters coming out with saying, hey, the fourth trimester, um, there's a lot of things you still need to be doing and still need to be working on to kind of get your body back to where it was before. Um, so my first thing to, would be to say, check out some of those those resources. Um, if you, there's Get PT First is an organization that does a lot of kind of PT advocacy. And so if you just kind of went on Google and you searched fourth trimester um, PT or Get PT First, there's a lot of really good stuff out there about things to do for that. But Um, my recommendation would be just start simple really early on. I mean, there's going to be a lot going on with the body. So even if you can just think about isometrics of, you know, can I draw my belly button in towards my spine while maintaining good abdominal breathing and drawing that pelvic floor kind of up and in, um, those Kegel exercises that everyone hears about, that's definitely, um, those are two really good places to start when it comes to starting to retrain that. And as that gets stronger and as, you know, your doctor starts to clear you for, for doing other exercise, you know, slowly progressing things and really working on control instead of just doing a ton of crunches or a lot of big movements. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, that's a, that's a lot of information in and around pregnancy and childbirth. Um, did you want to, uh, switch to, you know, any individuals that may have had, uh, a surgery? Um, and that sure. obviously could be, you know, any area in the body, um, you know, so you have upper and lower extremity. Um, so what, what are some things, you know, for the master's athlete to, to keep in mind if they have had a, a, a previous surgery at some point in their life? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something, you know, talking about history that masters just tend to have more than a junior population. Whenever I ask the juniors if they've had surgery, they kind of look at me like, no, I haven't had surgery. Are you kidding me? Um, whereas a lot of masters have, whether it was something really simple, like, you know, an appendix or any anything that's an abdominal surgery, or maybe it was an orthopedic surgery. Maybe they tore their ACL when they were in high school or had a, um, a rotator cuff repair in their shoulder. Um, so many people now have all these other procedures that have been done and we really need to take that into account. So from an orthopedic perspective, um, whether it's a joint replacement or an ACL repair, or we talked about rotator cuff or hip labrum, all these things. Um, it's just recognizing that that joint or that those soft tissues might not 
respond as well to load as the other side, as your teammates, and just recognizing that, yeah, if you had a surgery, you know, maybe get checked out by someone if you are having pain, because there could be some limitations in your joint mobility or um, in some strength components that are really important to address. Um, so would you, would you, um, give any specific advice to a rower, say if they were sweep compared to sculling? Um, and obviously that's going to depend on the, the surgery they have, but let's just, let's just play devil's advocate and say, um, you know, the rotator cuff, um, you know, upper extremity, uh, injury, um, you know, sweep compared to the sculling if they're, they're rotating a little bit. More. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So the rotator cuff is really important for, um, stability of the shoulder joint, which is something that's often overlooked in rowing. Um, everyone, you know, you are very glad that everyone, or we hope everyone sees our sport as being more of a leg driven sport. And everyone's like, Oh yeah, you don't use your arms very much, but you do in the sense that that shoulder needs to have stability in order to essentially serve as a link in the chain. I mean, you have the oar handle in your hands and sure your legs are generating the power, but if you don't have that stability in your shoulder, that's just going to be a weak link. That's not going to be able to transfer the power from your foot structures to your handle. And things are just going to get a little bit, Um, a little bit wonky in terms of where that pressure is being put on your body. So when it comes to the shoulder and the stability there, you know, if someone knows they have a history of shoulder, a shoulder injury on one side and they're sweep rowing and they have to pick a side, typically that outside arm is just going to take more load than the inside arm. So it might be wise to at least start on one side. So, you know, the left shoulder, Let's say maybe port's not a great idea. Let's go over to starboard where that right arm can take a little bit more load. Um, Now that's going to be different for every single individual. Some people after they've had a surgery have are stronger on that side than the other side. So it's really going to be person dependent, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. And then with sculling, if, you know, one side's weaker than the other, one side doesn't have more, more mobility than the other. And you're looking to do a very symmetrical, movement with both sides that can be tricky and you might not (laughs) that boat might not be going as straight as you think think it should (laughs) if one side's a little bit weaker than the other so it's something just to keep in mind that again you know you have this history as an athlete and how is that going to impact the choices that you make in terms of maybe the size boat you're in maybe the sweeping or sculling maybe the side of the boat that you're rowing so great point that that's definitely something to keep in mind wow that was that was excellent um i'm just curious it, in your experience uh, you know so far it, have you um had a certain sort of injury type that you've worked with more more often than not in the in the rowing population Hands down, low backs. I mean, those always, always come up and it's consistent with the research that's out there that says that the low back is the most injured area for rowers. I mean, when we think about the load that the spine has to take being this big link between, like I talked about before, the handle and the foot plate and how that is an important link. And it doesn't mean that the the spine or the back muscles or anything like that should be taking a ton of that load because you should be putting it in, you know, the glutes and in the core and things like that. But often when there is a missing link or a weak link, whether it's the shoulders or the glutes or um, mobility deficits in other parts of the body, that's definitely going to make that back start to fail a little bit. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, So, when looking at um, the, the the low back, so we, we we've talked, to, we're starting to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, if somebody's coming to you, they're they're a rowing athlete. Um, what are some of the things? Obviously, b- besides sort of the the clinical evaluation, what what types of questions do you ask them? What are some th- considerations? Um, you know, you, you would want that athlete to start making not only in terms of training and, and sort of day-to-day preparation, but 
things to consider, you know, when they get on the erg or in the boat to make themselves, you know, more comfortable, um, to put themselves in better position, not only for performance, but also just making sure this doesn't reoccur down the road once they get healthy again. Yeah. So I think one of the important factors to think about whether it's a master's athlete or another athlete is what are they doing through the rest of their day? I mean, you talk about being comfortable on the erg, being comfortable at practice, but that's, you know, two to three hours of a day that's spent not rowing most of the rest of the time. So that's often a question I ask is, well, what else are you doing? Are you sitting in an office chair all day? Are you, um, are you a construction worker that's, that's doing a lot of physical work? Are you, you know, what, what are the daily life tasks? Because that can significantly impact what your body makeup is like in terms of different muscle imbalances or things like that. And that will significantly impact what your body does when it sits on the erg or when it sits in the boat, especially if, you know, you're an athlete, master's athlete who goes from their entire day at work and then pops himself in a boat at 6 PM and expects to then row for two hours. So, you know, if you've been sitting in an office chair all day and then you go and you sit in the boat for another two hours, we need to figure out a way to change that up a little bit so that you don't always sit and then have, um, you know, weak glutes and a lumbar spine that's just not super happy during, you know, the whole rest of the day and during that workout. So I think my first questions are often about what they're doing outside of, outside of rowing so that I can figure out not only what changes we can make to those other times throughout the day, but also how is that going to impact how they're sitting in the boat? Yeah. So definitely, uh, asking some, some, uh, pointy questions about lifestyle factors, uh, what they're doing outside of their occupation, um, probably sleep as well. Um, Absolutely. you know, that type of thing. Um, so in addition to, to low back, what other, um, orthopedic issues kind of around rowing do you typically see? Yeah. So the interesting thing that we see more with master's athletes compared to more of the junior athletes or the college level athletes, kind of like that, um, the study that you mentioned earlier talks about is that we tend to see more upper extremity injuries in masters compared to the younger rowers. So, um, the reason for this, which is, is so interesting is that what tends to happen, like we had talked about a little bit is as we age, we get unfortunately, a decline in the muscle mass in our legs. It just happens with time, no matter how active you are, it, it's, it just happens. So with that, knowing that the legs are, the glutes, the quads are huge power generators in the rowing stroke. If those aren't up to snuff and aren't, don't have the ability to generate as much power, something else has to take that load. And what we tend to find with masters is that that usually goes into the neck and the shoulders. So we tend to see that more upper extremity injuries, the shoulder, the neck with this population, just given the technical changes that happen because of that weakness. Um, I see it a lot and it's a tough habit to break, especially if this person has been sitting in kind of a slouched posture with rounded shoulders and a little bit more of that uh, thoracic kyphosis, that arched or rounded mid back it can be a tough thing to fix. Um, but it's definitely an important factor in order to make sure that they can row pain free. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So w- that type of individual, so a master's athlete that has a, a more pronounced kyphotic posture, you know, that, that upper mid back, um, you know, at that point in their life, if they've been in that type of posture for a long time, you're not s- suddenly just going to change that. Right. So exactly. What do they need to do? How do they start working on that to, you know, maybe not completely, you know, reverse that, but get into a better position, just, just get improvement. Great question. So I think, like you said, it's not necessarily going to get 
back to perfect, but we can make some changes in how much mobility those joints have. And the important thing I think, or the most important thing for this type of person is also making sure that, yeah, that might be their anatomy at this time, but are the tissues around it, the muscles, the ligaments, are those able to handle the load that you're putting on it given that posture? So what I often spend a lot of time doing with this population is more, we do work on mobility through the thoracic spine, but also strength. You know, do they have muscles in their mid back that can handle the load, the increased load that is being put on that kyphotic spine in that region? So, you know, doing a lot of work with those thoracic extensor muscles, Um, trying to work as much overhead and work on kind of opening the chest up as much as possible and lengthening some of the tissues in the chest area, the pecs, to get that as much open as possible, but then following that up with some strengthening exercises to really um, try as much as we can to have those tissues be able to tolerate more load because everyone has different anatomy. We all look different. We all have stiffness here or hypermobility here, but it's really about the tissues being able to handle the load in that area, given the anatomy that we have. hundred percent. Absolutely. So how, how do you, um, how do you go about strengthening? Like what are, what are some exercises you, uh, you like to have, you know, your, your patients do? Great question. So I like, especially with those extremely kyphotic Um, people, I really like the use of a, like a physio ball, kind of having them lie over the ball and get some mobility through those arms over the ball. Um, what I also like too is, yeah, we might not be able to get a ton of extension out of that thoracic spine, kind of reversal of that kyphosis, but rotation is coupled with extension. So if we can work on getting more rotation through that area, that will help too. So kind of you know, the open book stretches or thread the needle, things that involve more of that thoracic rotation can be really helpful and help to then gain a little bit more extension when that might just be really tough to get. Okay. Okay. So do you, would you have them do like YTWLs over a Swiss ball or some type of row variation, either with, um, you know, maybe a, a, um, a weight or a band? Great question. So I think that stuff is definitely... It, it can be very good. My concern sometimes with that is what muscle groups is the person recruiting when they're doing that exercise. Sure. So what I often see is that when people are doing, you know, their YTWs, they're getting all into those upper traps. They're just, you know, cramming on it. And then their shoulders are shrugging up towards their ears and it's just not super productive. So yeah, I think some of those exercises can be really great, but really promoting kind of pulling those shoulders down away from the ears and recruiting those lower traps can be extremely important because we all have tight upper traps. We all feel like those muscles are just working on overdrive. So it's really about making sure the right muscle groups are kicking in. But yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, focusing on those mid traps, the lower traps to really kind of open things up can be really great as long as the person's not kind of dumping into really poor form. So form is key, um, both with strength and conditioning and, you know, your prehab exercises. Um, and also with just rowing form with these athletes, like we had talked about with making sure that they're recruiting the right right muscle groups, just because, uh, we know that having poor form can really lead to injuries as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it can. Um, and that's a great, point you make in regards to you know the ytwl exercises is that um you know in in the in the clinic i work in one of my colleagues he 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 actually says all the time he thinks that's one of the most challenging exercises to do correctly because it should be absolutely yeah even just purely just body weight because um it's if you're doing it right it is so lower and mid trap dominant um, and really being able to, uh, from that motor control standpoint that we were talking about earlier, uh, focus on having the movement come from there versus, you know, the, the upper trap rotator cuff, like really shrugging up. Most people don't have, um, the ability to feel that difference. 
Totally. And most rowers are also, you know, because of the nature of the sport, are very rhomboid dominant. So the rhomboids are those muscles that are in your mid back that essentially connect your shoulder blades, the medial border of your shoulder blades to your spine. So they squeeze your shoulder blades together. But what they also do, which is challenging, is they pull those shoulder blades down into downward rotation. So rowers often are already kind of in a position with those shoulder blades that isn't optimal for movement overhead and kind of makes those upper traps work harder and all these things. So really focusing on making sure that the mid traps and the lower traps are firing instead of just kind of like cramming those shoulder blades up and together is going to be really key with some of those exercises. And that's what I worked a lot on with the athletes, the master's athletes that I worked on in that class at CRI is it was a lot about form and a lot of them, you know, had habits that were really tough to break from a motor control perspective of, Oh, I've been doing this exercise for so long. And it's like, you watch them do it. And every time they do it, their shoulders are cramming up towards their ears. And as soon as they pull them down, it's like, Oh my gosh, this is so much harder, but it seems so much more productive. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what it should feel like. So yeah, it can, like you said, I mean, it should feel challenging. So I often start people with no bands, no weights, just body weight and really working on making sure the right muscle groups are firing. Yeah. So do you prefer to do, um, to target mid to lower trap? Um, because that's clearly, uh, an area of the, the, uh, back that needs some development for, for rowers because it's just, it's not getting, uh, you know, work as, as much work due to the, the nature of the rowing stroke, the posture that you're in. Um, but so making sure that they're not kind of reverting back to, uh, a position or a pattern where they're going into using their upper trap. What are some exercises you, you feel are more productive to get them to target the lower to mid trap? Yeah, that's a great question. So oftentimes, well, the, I think the low trap is the key one here is that when we often see that kyphotic posture, those shoulder blades are also really tilted forward, call it an anterior tilt. So the low trap is what's controlling that the low trap is the muscle group that kind of pulls those shoulder blades back and kind of tilts them backwards, putting your shoulder blade in a better position to not only move your arm up over your head, but also to, um, take load. And in the rowing stroke, I often have to work with rowers on that because they come up to the catch and their shoulders are up towards their ears and their shoulders are totally dumped forward. And the low trap is what's going to pull them back and really lock those shoulder blades down um, out of that tilted forward position, which is just going to disperse that load a little bit greater throughout the body. Um, and that one, that muscle group is huge. And the serratus anterior is another really hugely important one, which we can get to in a little bit too. I don't want to get too sidetracked with it, but, um, that one's huge too. And that's all about holding that shoulder blade onto your rib cage and making sure again, having a nice tight link between all of the areas in, in your body that are taking that load in the stroke. I love it. Yeah. It's uh, all these all these complementary and supplementary muscles are, are super important. Um, so for, for lower trap, would you have them do something maybe with a, a light resistance band, like a 90, 90 external rotation where they have to really think about, you know, moving from that, that lower trap? Potentially I like things. So when we, the lower trap, I usually like to work the lower trap with the arms overhead, kind of in like a Y position. Cause that's going to help, promote that upward rotation and that, that tilt of the shoulder blade that we want. So if you can put the arms overhead, um, I usually like to start with people just kind of feeling the muscles with their arms up. Like your, I say, I always say, Hey, go against the wall and put your arms up. Like you're doing the YMCA and they do that. And I have them, you know, gently just let their arms come up, not really shrugging up to super far, just kind of gently letting their shoulder blades come up and then really thinking about pulling their shoulder blades down away from their ears. Um, just doing that a few times, getting that muscle group turned on. And then from there, trying to then lift the arms back without extending through the lower back and really starting to work on getting that lower trap to do a little bit more of that scapular depression and that posterior tilt, which is more of what we want um, 
in order to prevent some of those shoulder injuries that happen with rowing. So that's a good place to start. And then kind of progressing from there to doing stuff lying on your stomach, because then you've got some more gravity involved. Trying to lift those arms up from there can be challenging. Um, One thing I really like for rowers, whether it's Um, it's just a really good general warm up exercise that I really like is I have them find some sort of bar or ledge or sink or something like that and hang off of it and almost come into a little squat, put their hands either on the bar or on the sink. It should be right around waist height and sit back. And what tends to happen first is those shoulders pop up towards their ears and they're kind of hanging and they're not really in any sort of strong position and they're kind of just floating there. And then I usually say, okay, now really lock your shoulder blades down and almost pretend like you're sucking your shoulder joint, your shoulder, the ball into the socket. And all of a sudden they're just so much stronger. Their shoulders are down away from their ears. The low traps engaged, the serratus is engaged. They're like, Oh wow. Now I can actually like hang here and I feel really solid. So I really like that exercise as a way to, feel what an active hang should feel like. So shoulder blades are active, low trap is active and all those things to kind of get that muscle group firing up a little bit more. Great. Great. Those are some awesome, uh, some exercises that folks can do on their own. Very good. Simple stuff, body weight, no, no equipment necessary. Pretty sure we can all find a, a bar or a, uh, you know, fence post or something around waist height that we can, that we can use in our environment to, to try that one out. Exactly. I mean, you do need to build strength in these muscle groups, but I find that people tend to go right towards strength and almost try too hard when those muscles don't have the control yet. So if we can add the control in first and really just work on activating them, then once they're turned on, then they can be strengthened a little bit more appropriately. So I, I nine times out of 10 have to start with that motor control piece with people. So I think that's a really great place for really everyone to start is by saying, Hey, can I even find these muscles? Because most people can't. Yeah. And that's right. There is such a key point. Um, you know, just talking about taking the time to slow down and repattern and making sure you're moving from the proper muscle groups and sequencing correctly. Absolutely. Um, Cause as you, you spoke about earlier, if, uh, you know, if, if we have, uh, had an athlete that has gone through pregnancy and childbirth, um, some of the other bigger muscle groups might be taking over and becoming more dominant. There's a lot of, uh, repatterning that might have to take place. Definitely. And like we've talked about too, masters athletes have a harder time with that repatterning than a younger athlete might. So it's something that it takes a lot of patience to kind of work through that phase of, Hey, I kind of need to learn how to move and I need to learn how to move better. And masters athletes, the same thing applies to them as it does to juniors where, you know, they're learning a skill, they're learning how to turn the right muscles on. And then from there they can load the muscles. I feel like often ha- what happens with masters is especially if they've come into the sport later, they skip that step. They kind of go right from, okay, here's the sequencing of the stroke. Okay, you go. And it just turns into kind of a workout from there versus really taking time to learn the skill and learning how the body should move. And it's just going to take a little bit more time. Yeah. 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 So definitely be patient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moral of the story is be patient, which I know is tough, but it'll have better effects and you'll be rowing better down the line. Awesome. Um, and you wanted to talk a little bit, I think, about the, the serratus anterior. Oh, yeah. So, again, just another important muscle group that I really think is important with, you know, that that missing link. So a lot of times if there's whether it's a shoulder injury or a neck injury or really anything, I look at it with the low back, too that shoulder blade needs to be able to be kind of locked on to that rib cage. And I often find that this is, you know, missing in a lot of athletes, whether they're injured or not. And you can see that with winging, if the shoulder blade kind of pops off of the rib cage, then that's a sign that that muscle isn't working as well. Um, So, you know, doing some exercises that I think it's really about 
again, being aware of where the body is, you know, when you're doing a plank or when you're doing bird dog, really any exercise that you're on your hands and knees, where are your shoulder blades? Can you kind of pull them back a little bit, make sure they're locked onto your rib cage and, I, I definitely do some specific serratus exercises with my patients, but I often revamp their current core routine or things like that just to incorporate that muscle's ability to fire during those exercises. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So really, um, you, you're taking some time to uh, sprinkle in um, some of these exercises that are going to also help kind of repattern uh, and build some of that muscular endurance in some of these key areas. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times, like we've talked about with older athletes and, you know, these joints that just aren't as, aren't as clean, aren't as smooth as they used to be. It's often about finding those smaller muscle groups and getting those to fire to give the joint more stability versus the big muscle groups that generate power. Those are often the ones that are overactive and need to be calmed down a little bit in order to decrease some of the pain in a condition like arthritis or something like that. So it's often about some of those smaller, more control muscles that haven't been working as much that need to be turned on in order to decrease some pain. Interesting. Interesting. Do you, do you find, um, is that just more common with the master's athlete just because they're a little bit older that maybe at that point they've been in a occupation where they've been sitting a little bit more. So some of those muscles have atrophied or they haven't, um, they're not using them compared to, um, you know, let's just use, cause we've talked about it, upper trap versus lower trap. Um, that's sort of their default, you know, pattern, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I think, I mean, the glutes are a huge one, of the, a huge example of that too. So yeah, the lower trap and upper trap, that's one that, yeah, if you've been working at a desk job for 20 years and shoulders are always kind of rounded forward, you're always shrugging up towards your ears, then it's going to take a lot of time and effort to undo that pattern that's been there for longer. So with masters, like we've talked about, it's kind of just about time. You know, yes, we get older, we get wiser, but also our bodies fall into habits that have been there now for a very long time that can be really challenging to undo. So it really is about kind of finding these muscle groups that maybe haven't been working as much and have been inhibited because other muscle groups have just dominated for so long. Uh, I find that a lot with the glutes. Like I had just said, I think those, um, often when I see people and I talk about them, they're like, you're the first person who's ever told me that I need to turn these muscles on. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like you're 65 years old and no one's told you in your whole sport history that those muscles are important. So I think that it's often quite an awakening for people to kind of hear about some of these muscle groups that they just, you know, have gone through sport their whole life and haven't really, heard a lot of specifics about them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to get them to kind of repattern, um, and make some progress be given the fact that they have, um, you know, been using other muscle groups. I mean, are they really going to have to make it a priority or I'm imagining the conversation you're, you're saying to them or having with them is this is something that you're going to have to make a daily habit because if you don't put in time to do it, you're, you're just going to go back to what you've always been doing. Exactly. And that can be challenging. So I try to make it as simple as possible. You know, if, those glutes aren't firing and they're having a hard time even finding where they are. Like, Hey, you're sitting in your car, try to squeeze your glutes. You're standing at your standing desk at work. Great. Try and squeeze your glutes. You know, just the more input you can give to those muscles, the more that connection is going to increase. You know, we've talked about that brain plasticity input is really important to get that control. Um, to improve that control. So if you can, you know, I'm not saying all day go around squeezing your butt cheeks together because that would be awkward and <laughs> uncomfortable, but, you know, trying to do it frequently to increase that connection of your brain to that muscle group. So yeah, it takes some time and then it takes some time doing it in different positions, you know, making sure your glutes are, can be active when you're squatting, when you're at the finish, when you're at the catch, when you're on the recovery, everywhere without having to like consciously tell them to work all the time. It takes a little bit of time to get that to be a little less conscious. Yeah. 
So definitely frequency, especially early on, uh, to, to kind of reintegrate, um, and reestablish that motor pattern is going to be a, a key, key part of that. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wow. Well, we have covered a ton of ground here. Uh, is there yeah. anything um, that you want to kind of touch on uh, kind of as we as we wrap up here? Uh, sure. So I think the big takeaways, I would say, for master's athletes when it comes to preventing injury is we've talked about patience, but it's it's really about that technical focus. And that's something, like I said, that's often lost, especially if it's an athlete that's coming to the sport a little bit later. They kind of go from a learn to row kind of right into a general sweeps program or something like that, where it's not about refining the form as much as it's just about getting a workout in. And so I think it's really important to have that technical focus to make sure that the right muscle groups are turning on, the core is nice and locked in, the glutes are working, you're getting a hip hinge that's appropriate for the rowing stroke and all of those things that need to be refined before adding a ton of load. So patience with adding a ton of load, um, especially early on. And then, I mean, ultimately keep rowing and have fun because it is such a great sport and it's doing so we've talked a lot about the negative things that it can be doing for your body with injuries and things like that. But ultimately it's, um, it's a great place to be. We talked about very early on about kind of decreasing risk for osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease and all that stuff. So keep doing it, but take care of your body. You're an athlete and you need to treat your body like that. So recover, you know, do the proper warm up and cool down and have fun, but make sure that you're also taking care of yourself. Yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. I think, um, I really like the emphasis on, uh, this, the skill part, um, the, the, the technical component, um, because rowing is, there is a huge, huge technical and skill, uh, component to the, to the rowing stroke, to the sport. Um, and so if you're a little bit more patient and diligent up front, especially as you learn, um, it's going to pay a lot of dividends later on, uh, on the, on the fitness side of things, uh, as well. Um, so that's, that's a great piece of advice there. Thank you for listening to the Leo training podcast. If this content is important to you, please be sure to rate and review so more people can listen. Also, you may follow me on social media, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook to get weekly free content. For more in-depth content, please subscribe to my email newsletter at my website, leotraining.io. Be sure to check out the resources page to download free, helpful content. If you have any questions or feedback, please contact me directly by email at joe at leotraining.io or via Instagram. The handle is at leotraining. Thank you again for listening and have a great day.